Well, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, a friend of Baylor, uh, Professor Paul Griffiths, who will be our speaker. But before I do, I want to remind you of what a rich banquet this has been for folks like us who have uh, voracious intellectual appetites. The combination of plenary and colloquial presentations and panel discussions have really been a sumptuous meal, a real feast of food for thought. Last night we heard a really provocative presentation from Kathleen Norris. Her title, False Pretenses, My Teenage Crush on Soren Kierkegaard, Trying on Faith for Size, it resonated with me a great deal, especially the first part of the title. Given my own narrative, my title would have been Confused Intellectual Appetites, My College Crush on Soren Kierkegaard and Trying on Philosophy for Size. And why is that? Well, before I provide a short explanation of that, and I see Jason and Darren nodding with approval about short, <laughs> let me tell you a bit about our speaker, Paul Griffiths, whose presentation will no doubt add to the richness and substance of our bountiful banquet. Professor Griffiths is the Warren Professor of Catholic Theology in the Divinity School at Duke University. His educational pedigree and scholarly career manifests a breadth and depth greatly to be admired and infrequently achieved. Speaking of the breadth of his education, Professor Griffiths' BA is in theology with first class honors from Oxford University. He has an MPhil also from Oxford in classical Indian religion and Sanskrit and a PhD in Buddhist studies, including Sanskrit and Tibetan thought from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. His competencies in language include Latin and classical Greek, Sanskrit, classical Tibetan, French, German, and some Italian. Now, when he begins to speak, you will notice that he's not from Texas. <laughs> Though it's rumored that he's asked his colleague Stanley Hauerwas and Ralph Wood to help him master the East Texas dialect of English. <laughs> a major task indeed. Professor Griffith's very productive scholarly career exhibits a breadth in a variety of ways. He's the sole author of nine books, the co-author or editor or co-editor of seven more, his scholarly writings in peer-reviewed and other scholarly venues number 60 or more publications. If we include his book reviews, his writings in non-refereed and popular but important public venues like Commonweal, The Christian Century, First Things, and a number of others, if you count all those, it's over 200, no, 260. The overall picture of his publications provide a picture of a person who understands his role as a Christian scholar, includes both his responsibilities to his guild, narrowly and professionally defined, but also the larger and maybe more important project of serving the Catholic Church and the Christian intellectual tradition and our common republic. And in doing so, Professor Griffiths exhibits a lively and well-formed Christian mind, not only by the virtue of the excellence he's achieved in a variety of traditional scholarly and teaching activities, but also in a variety of practices that I shall unify by reference to the social role I call being a Christian public intellectual. Indeed, many of the kinds of scholarly teaching and mentoring that matter most to many of us are the kinds that are found in venues like Commonweal, First Things, and his many illuminating book reviews. 
The breadth and depth of his intellectual in interests are also evident by a quick survey of the title of his books. I'll not mention all nine of them, but one, the beginning, the first was on being mindless, Buddhist meditation on the mind-body problem. In the mental era, problems of religious diversity. More recently, the Song of Songs, a commentary, a very provocative and alluring commentary on the Song of Songs. Given the astonishing breadth of his intellectual training and intellectual accomplishments, both with, for the church and for our common public life, I think it's reasonable to expect a lecture that will stimulate our intellectual appetite rightly, provoking us to think deeply and perhaps in new ways, new ways with respect to insights on Kierkegaard on authority and autonomy. I use the phrase stimulate our intellectual appetite rightly because some intellectual appetites are disordered, as Professor Griffiths helps us see in his fine book, Intellectual Appetite, A Theological Grammar. Curiositas and studiositas name two different kinds of intellectual appetites, the latter, the latter virtue and praiseworthy appetite, the appetite for knowledge, the other a vice and a defective kind of sinful appetite for knowledge. And looking back at my crush on Soren Kierkegaard when I was in college, I sometimes now worry that it was of the latter sort. Uh, not, I sometimes worry that I desired this new knowledge about Soren Kierkegaard, not because it allowed me to participate in the acquisition of some common goods made possible by a shared conversation about common themes in fear and trembling, either or, no exit, nausea, the myth of Sisyphus or the stranger. Rather, I desire to possess a new vocabulary in order to exercise power over my newfound friends at Washita Baptist University or my parents and the members of the church of my youth, Oak Grove Missionary Baptist Church. So my attraction to Kierkegaard was not so much for the real Kierkegaard, made available through the insightful presentations of our speakers at this conference, but that Kierkegaard that legitimized the renunciation of every allegiance and every authority, but the autonomous and sovereign I, clearly a misreading of Kierkegaard. Tonight we hear from Professor Paul Griffiths, whose lecture will no doubt be a corrective for those misunderstandings and misappropriations. Let's welcome him to the podium. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take my jacket off. The uh, lights are warm, so I hope that's all right. Um, so before I get to the talk, um, four brief prefatory comments. Um, first of all, a warning. I'm just getting over a rather bad cold, and uh, my voice, therefore, um, is in danger of giving out at any moment. So. Um, if I stop after 10 minutes, then that's why. Um, but I'll do my best not to. Um, the second thing is, is gratitude to Darren for the invitation and for the work of the Institute uh, on Faith and Learning. I first came to one of these conferences six or seven years ago. It was on the topic of friendship. I learned a great deal from that. Uh, and I have a great admiration and respect for the work of the Institute. The third prefatory comment is closely connected to the second one. Um, it's one of regret. When I've come to these in the past, I've really enjoyed being present for the whole thing. I wasn't able to do that this time, and I do regret that very much. Um, the reason is that uh, a colleague of mine at Duke University, who some of you know, Stanley Harawas, had his retirement symposium yesterday. It went on till excessively late last night, in fact. Um, and I couldn't avoid being there, so uh, that's why I didn't come until today. But I do regret not having heard what's been going on the last couple of days here. And the fourth and final prefatory comment is um, a disclaimer. There are some real scholars of Kierkegaard here in this room. 
There are many in the world. I am not one of them. Um, Mike listed a number of languages I have some competence in. Danish is not among them. Um, <clears throat> that by itself is enough to rule me out as uh, anyone with serious scholarly interests in Kierkegaard. My acquaintance with him, then, is that of an amateur. That word, though, of course, means etymologically lover. And I've always loved reading him, at least since my teenage years. And I've been reading him on and off for a very long time. I've never published a word about him. And I don't think I've ever given a formal talk about him until tonight. So you're faced here not with an expert in the thought of Kierkegaard, but rather with someone who has read him more or less devotionally for a long time, been provoked by him, not always to agreement, I must say, um, and who finds him among the sharpest and most provocative of thinkers that the human race has yet produced, I think. So, to the talk itself. Well, one more thing. Um, about 30 years ago, I read a short book by Kierkegaard in the old translation by Walter Lowry. The book is called The Book on Adler. And I was fascinated by that book then, and it's been bubbling around in my subconscious ever since. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's not one of his better known works, but it raises some absolutely fascinating questions. So I'm hoping that in what I have to say, I can get at those. I reread the book in the more recent and um, somewhat less elegant, but no doubt more accurate rendering by um, the Hongs in the Princeton series with very useful editorial apparatus. But I still have a liking for the old Lowry translation, but I no doubt the scholars in the room will tell me that's a mistake, but in any case. Okay, this is a talk about apostleship in conversation with Soren Kierkegaard. Its central questions are, what is it to be an apostle? What kind of authority do apostles have? How ought those who receive an, an apostolic call respond to it? How ought those who are not themselves apostles respond when they find themselves faced and addressed with apostolic authority by those who are apostles? Where, if anywhere, is apostolic authority to be found among those living now. Authority is the thread that connects all these questions. As we shall see, the question about apostolicity is in the end a question about authority, at least so far as Christians are concerned. It will be helpful to have before us, as we begin, Kierkegaard's understanding of what an apostle is. And all the quotations that I'm about to use in, the, in what follows are taken from the book on Adler. So in that book, he defines the apostle in several ways on half a dozen occasions. Two key definitions, however, are the following. First, an apostle is not born. An apostle is a man who is called and appointed by God and sent by him on a mission. That's the first definition. A second one. The apostle is the one who has divine authority to command both the crowd and the public. That's the second definition. These are definitions he repeats and embroiders, and I'll return to them in my talk. The talk is framed by an overture and a coda, which have the form of a brief commentary on and response to two pieces of scripture. And its central part has three movements, the first of which is an exposition of the case of Adolf Peter Adler, a Danish Lutheran pastor contemporary with Kierkegaard, who took himself to have received a direct verbal revelation from Jesus Christ and thus to have been commissioned as an apostle. The second movement of the talk is a depiction and analysis of Kierkegaard's treatment of Adler's case in the book on Adler, a work in which much is said, not only about Adler's case in particular, but also about the idea of apostleship in general. And the third movement is a suggestion about how to understand and respond to apostolic calls, whether one's own or another's, which I take to be an improvement on Adler's response to his own case, and even on Kierkegaard's analysis of that response. Now, disagreeing with Kierkegaard, which I will do in the third movement of this talk, is always a risky thing. 
He was one of the most sharp-witted and dialectically skilled people ever to have walked the earth. And to attempt disagreement with him is usually to find oneself on a very sticky wicket indeed. The attempt to push through a criticism of him usually runs aground on the discovery that he's already thought of and forestalled that problem, and that may well be the case this time too. Nevertheless, I'm going to give it a try. One shows no greater respect to anyone than disagreeing with them, it seems to me, taking them seriously enough to disagree with them. First, then, the overture, for which my texts are taken from the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. In that first chapter, there are two annunciation stories, one to Zechariah and one to Mary. In the first of these, the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah in the Jerusalem temple, tells him that his wife Elizabeth is pregnant with a boy, and instructs him that he should name the boy John. You all know this, of course, but I'll remind you anyway. In the second, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, tells her that she will conceive a son and instructs her, that he instructs her that she should call him Jesus. In both annunciations, the angel provides some details about the future careers of these two infants still in utero. These two annunciation stories fit perfectly the definition of apostleship with which we're working. Both Zechariah and Mary are directly called and commissioned by the Lord, or at least by an angel speaking the Lord's words, and are instructed to perform a specific task, which is to say, given a mission. The mission includes, in both cases, the act of naming. Mary and Zechariah do not, however, respond in the same way. Zechariah asks, how shall I know this? and follows the question with a mention of what he apparently takes to be the principal evidence against the truth of what the angel says, which is that both he and his wife Elizabeth are old beyond the age of childbearing. How shall I know this is a perfectly ordinary kind of question in response to a claim that seems to you to promise something that's very unlikely to happen. It's a question that takes us into the realm of epistemology. Zechariah doesn't believe what the angel says to be true. He thinks there's very strong evidence against it, and he wants to defer acting on his apostolic commission until he's been given enough evidence to convince him that he should act on it. The angel doesn't like Zechariah's answer. He strikes Zechariah dumb until the day that these things come to pass and gives as reason for doing so that Zechariah has shown a lack of faith. Mary's response to her apostolic commission is quite different. She asks a question too, but it's not the same one. She asks, how shall this be? Not, how shall I know this, but how shall this be? She adds, since I have no husband. This question Gabriel answers directly by explaining in veiled terms the Holy Spirit's part in the affair, and Mary then responds with the words of acceptance. Ecce ancilla domini fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. You all know Mary spoke good Latin, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> she, <coughs> the gospel account makes abundantly clear, has asked the right question. She doesn't ask to be convinced that what the angel promises will occur. She knows that in the usual way of things, pregnancy requires sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, and she is interested to know how it will occur in her case without such intercourse. The angel explains, and that's enough for her to speak the words of acceptance. So that's the overture. It presents us with two apostles, according to the definition we're working with, two human beings called and commissioned by the Lord. Neither of these two doubts that they are called that they have been given an apostolic commission. Zechariah's doubts aren't about that. They're about whether he has enough evidence to make it proper for him to give his consent to the commission without being given further evidence that the deeply surprising state of affairs the angel describes will in fact come to pass. Mary has no doubts of that kind. She'd just like some more details about how what the angel promises will in fact happen. The difference between her response and Zechariah's is subtle, perhaps, but real and of great importance. It's marked in the scriptural texts by the deeply different responses the angel gives to Mary's and Zechariah's questions. With that overture in mind then, let's now turn to the first movement of the talk proper, which is a brief description of the apostolic commission of Adolf Peter Adler. In 1843 in Copenhagen, Adolf Peter Adler published a collection of his sermons. 
Adler was a Lutheran minister with care of two small parishes on the Baltic island of Bornholm, a long way to the east of mainland Denmark. For the time and place, and for a man with such a position, publication of a collection of sermons was ordinary enough. One thing about the collection, however, was not so ordinary. In it, Pastor Adler described a revelation he had received. Here's one part of what he wrote about that. I'm quoting Adler now. One evening, I had just given an account of the origin of evil. Fancy spending your evenings in that way. I had just given an account of the origin of evil. Then I perceived as if in a flash that everything depended not upon thought, but upon spirit, and that there existed an evil spirit. That same night, a hideous sound descended into our room. Then the Savior commanded me to get up and go in and write down these words. The words are, the first human beings could have had an eternal life because when thought joins God's spirit with the body, then the human being is God's child. So Adam would have been God's son, but they sinned. Thought immersed itself in itself without the world, without the body. It separated the spirit from the body, the spirit from the world. And when the human being himself, when thought itself separates the spirit from the body and the spirit from the world, the human being must die and the world and the body become evil. There's more. <laughs> the rest is about as murky and inflated as what I just quoted. When Adler finishes repeating what Jesus has said to him, he writes this. Then... Jesus commanded me to burn my own works and in the future to keep to the Bible. As for my sermons, from number six to the end, I know that they were written with Jesus' collaborating grace in which I have been only an instrument. Close quote. And Adler goes on to say that he obeyed Jesus' command to burn his own works, which were on Hegel's philosophy and especially Hegel's logic, after the publication of this volume of sermons and, and of several more works, Adler was subjected to discipline by the Danish Lutheran Church and was eventually removed from the pastorate. So much for Adler and his revelation. He was an almost exact contemporary of Kierkegaard's, of the same social class and education, and was, like Kierkegaard as well, in being a prolific writer. The two men knew one another, Middle-class Denmark in the first half of the 19th century appears to have been a tiny community in which everyone knew everyone else, though the two men were not intimate. Adler and his revelation would no doubt have vanished from history had his case not caught Kierkegaard's interest. In 1845 and 1846, a mass of documents about the Adler case was published in Copenhagen, including the records of the ecclesiastical proceedings against Adler and no less than four volumes of writings by Adler. Kierkegaard bought all this material, read at least some of it. We know not all of it because some of the pages apparently remain uncut in the volumes that he purchased of Adler's work. Um, but he read at least some of it, and in 1846 to 1847, he wrote a book about the case which has come down to us as the book on Adler. It's on that book that the remarks I'm making are based. However, although Kierkegaard revised and re-revised the book on Adler obsessively in the years following 1847, the editorial uh, apparatus in the Hong version is staggering in its detail, um, and it shows how obsessively Kierkegaard worked on this. Though he, he revised and re-revised it obsessively in the years following 1847, he never published it. Only one small section of it, the essay on the difference between a genius and an apostle, appeared in print during Kierkegaard's life, and that in a version with most of the references to the Adler case removed from it. The book on Adler has, I think, the distinction of being the most revised and least published of all Kierkegaard's works. It has also received, it seems to me, less attention by those thinking and writing about Kierkegaard these last 50 years or so than just about anything else he wrote. So, what is it that interested Kierkegaard so much about the Adler case, and why is it that his concern with that case has proved so comparatively uninteresting to Kierkegaard scholars of recent years? The issue that interested him, that also interests me, is that of apostolic authority. Following the definition I've already quoted, an apostle is someone appointed and called by the Lord to a particular mission and someone thereby given authority, 
One becomes an apostle not because of any virtues peculiar to oneself. One is not an apostle because one is intelligent or energetic or tall or beautiful or even possessed of an unusually accurate and penetrating understanding of the nature of Christianity. No. Rather, it's both necessary and sufficient for being an apostle that one be made so by the Lord's call. Kierkegaard is surely right about this. Those whom the Lord calls and commissions typically lack the qualifications the world might think necessary for the work. Think about David, or Paul, or Ignatius Loyola, or Thérèse of Lisieux. They're as likely to be weak, stupid, violent, and corrupt as they are to be strong, brilliant, peacemakers, and virtuous. And they're much more likely to resist being made apostles than they are to seek such status or easily to accept it. Adler's case fits this definition of the apostle perfectly well. He is directly addressed by Jesus and told to do three things. The first is to write down some words, including the ones I quoted to you just now. The second is to burn his own earlier writings, which Kierkegaard, it will come as no surprise to learn, interprets to mean keep away from Hegel. For a Kierkegaardian, if Jesus is anything at all, he's like to say that. (laughs) By his own account, Adler is called by means of auditions. He hears a noise hideous sound recall, which appears to presage or announce the voice of Jesus himself, and then he hears that voice directly, instructing him as noted. And then again, by his own account, he does what's asked of him, in that way fulfilling his apostolic commission, and in the process, leaving a record, a literary deposit of what he had been told to do, and of his having done it. So Adler, if he has in fact been spoken to by Jesus, And in a fashion typical of apostles, Adler's record of his own call and commission offers no comment on how it is that he knows the voice that speaks to him to be the voice of Jesus. He's almost the ideal type of the apostle. According to the definition, at least, Adler is every bit as much the apostle as St. Paul. And of course, Adler's own account of his call is influenced, causally speaking, by Old Testament accounts of prophetic commissioning, and most especially by the account of Paul's call given in the book of Acts. Kierkegaard recurs most often in the book on Adler to the example of Paul as the ideal type of the apostle. Now, the second movement of the talk, Kierkegaard on Adler. Just what does he say about him and why? Some preliminary distinctions will help us here. The first is that between the apostle who is convinced that he is one, convinced, that is, that he has received a commission from the Lord, on the one hand, And the apostle who, though he has in fact received such a call and therefore is in fact an apostle, an apostle in the order of being, we might say, is unaware of this fact about himself or in denial about it. Adler is in the first category, and it's almost exclusively those who belong to it that interest Kierkegaard. He's concerned with self-aware apostles, apostles who take themselves to be such, at least at the time of their call, and has little to say about those unaware of or in denial about their apostleship though he is interested in those whose behavior or attitudes subsequent to their call performatively contradict that call. So that's one distinction. A second distinction is that between the authority of the apostle's call for himself, on the one hand, and its authority for others, on the other hand. The degree of authoritative the degree of authoritativeness given by Saul about to become Paul to the Lord's words to him on the Damascus Road must in some sense be different for Paul than for those who hear him or read him and take him to be an apostle subsequently, and certainly so for those who do not take him to be an apostle at all. Kierkegaard is concerned with this difference, as we shall soon see. And a third distinction is that between the content of what the apostle hears and says and is commissioned to do, on the one hand, and the sheer fact of being called and commissioned on the other. Kierkegaard is interested in the fact of apostleship much more than in the content of any particular apostolic call or commission. In fact, it's not far from the truth to say that he's interested not at all in the content of a particular revelatory call, but only in the fact of it as a call, or more exactly, in what it ought to mean for an apostle to have been called as one and in what it ought to mean for those who are faced with and addressed by an apostle to be so faced and so addressed. In more detail then, Kierkegaard identifies his investigation of Adler's case as, I quote, 
an inquiry into the concept of authority, what it means to have divine authority, into the confusion so that the concept of authority has been completely forgotten in our confused age, close quote. He wants, that is, to investigate Adler's response to his apostolic call as a paradigmatic instance of how to misunderstand what such a call is. He does this by allowing, for the sake of the argument, that Adler really has been called, that Jesus really has spoken to him, as Adler reports him having done, and really has instructed him to burn his books and so on. Anyone in such a condition, Kierkegaard thinks, ought to understand that what has happened to him belongs to the religious sphere. He has been given a revelation, and this, I quote, must be accentuated unconditionally, close quote, as something that outstrips or exceeds in an utterly radical way anything that belongs to the ethical or the aesthetic sphere. To be an apostle, to be in possession of a revelation fact, as Kierkegaard again and again puts it, is not to be given anything that can enter as premise into an argument about what is good, what is beautiful, or what ought to be done or not done. Those conversations belong to the world. They are ethical or aesthetic or even political discussions, and with discussions of that sort, the properly religious, the revelatory or apostle constituting has nothing at all to do, as Kierkegaard sees things. To treat the revelation or call that one has received exactly as such, exactly as a word from the Lord, is to treat it as something whose authority is beyond question. It is not an exaggeration, I think, to say that for Kierkegaard, there can in principle be no criteria for assessing the validity or reliability of the apostolic call extrinsic to itself. It is not quite right even to say that an apostolic, course is, that an apostolic call is self-validating. It's better to say that as soon as the question of its validity arises, as soon as the one who has received such a call asks herself whether she has in fact received it, as soon that is as she goes epistemic, recalls Zechariah, rather than remains in the open-handed mode of receiving the gift given, recall Mary, as soon as she does that, she has begun to show that she does not take herself to have received a revelation and thus does not understand herself to be an apostle. It's rather like etiquette. If on meeting you for the first time, I have to consider whether you're the kind of person whose hand I should shake, then I have already exited the sphere of politeness. Even if I do then shake your hand, I do so not as a matter of etiquette, but rather something different, and I would say worse. Just so with going epistemic on an apostolic call. To decide on the basis of evidence that the voice addressing me is the voice of Jesus is exactly as Kierkegaard will see it, not to respond to it as the voice of Jesus at all, but rather as a conclusion to an argument. How then should Adler, as re recipient of an apostolic call, respond to the fact of it? Kierkegaard writes this, he must understand himself, that is Adler, in this, that it has happened to him, that it is the most certain of all that it has happened to him, and that without any subsequent chatter, without any turning and twisting, it was and is and remains a revelation." Close quote. These are familiar Kierkegaardian themes. The apostolic call is a matter of inwardness. It neither needs nor can get validation or support from anything external to itself. In the order of knowing, or as we may say at the epistemic level, it is more certain than anything else is or can be. It is an instance of what later philosophy would call, sometimes affirmingly and sometimes critically, the given. And the apostle is, above all else, one who is in receipt of the gift. What the apostle is given is himself as creature, himself before the Lord, himself as dialectically related to the Lord and as gifted by the Lord with authority. 
The apostle finds himself both under authority, which is to say the authority of the revelation given to him, and with authority for others because he has been commissioned to speak to them exactly as an apostle. There is, both for the apostle and for those who hear him, a single and simple question, which Kierkegaard repeats half a dozen times in the book on Adler. The question is, will you obey or will you not obey? The rejection of chatter in the earlier quotation I gave is also important. The apostle does not need to be loquacious. That's why I'm not one, right? You can tell. Um, either in explication or justification of the call he has received. Much less does he need to turn and twist in trying to understand or interpret his revelation or in seeking an endorsement of it as such from others. What the apostle does need is to find in the fact of his call an understanding of himself as he is before the Lord, a creature called and established as a creature gifted. That really is all. A man or woman in such a condition has quiet assurance of their condition and is extraordinary both statistically, apostles are few, and in virtue of the authority he possesses because of his apostleship. Those who have no apostolic call should be obedient to those who do, because the authority given by such a commission is of a different order than any worldly authority. And those who have such a call should, of course, themselves be obedient to it. Kierkegaard makes all those points in the first 30 pages or so of the book on Adler. Much of what follows is a detailed analysis of the evidence in Adler's writing that he does not, in fact, understand himself to have received an apostolic call. More exactly, Adler performatively contradicts the putative fact of his call by what he writes about it and by what he does as a result of having received it. If Adler has in fact received a revelation, Kierkegaard writes, it would be, quote, a paradoxical extraordinary provision, close quote, and he would be called by it simply to teach what he has been given and to do so with authority as St. Paul did. But Adler doesn't do that. Instead, he makes himself an interpreter of his own revelation. Acting towards it, Kierkegaard says, just as contemporary exegetes act towards scripture. In interpreting the revelation given to him, Adler recapitulates the modern history of the exegesis of scripture in particular and of the fact of Christianity more generally. And what is that history? It is to make Christianity, which here means something like what is given in scripture, a set of reference points or assumptions which need to be completed or brought to perfection by the application to them of the more mature understandings arrived at by thoughtful human beings in the modern period. Christianity on this view is something that needs to be developed, grist for the mill of modern thought, which will, with time, bring it to its required perfection. All this is anathema to Kierkegaard. Taking such a position is, as he sees it, sub to subordinate Christianity to something extrinsic to itself, to make of it a moment in a Hegelian dialectic of perfection, and thus to eviscerate it, to turn it into the plaything of an established church which no longer has any understanding of the gospel it takes itself to preach. These two are familiar Kierkegaardian themes. Kierkegaard's critique of Adler's stance toward his apostolic call shows how the Kierkegaardian critique of the church works on a small scale. And Kierkegaard tightens the screws when he analyzes the records of the Lutheran Church's proceedings against Adler. Those proceedings on Kierkegaard's reading do not directly attack Adler's claim to have received a revelation. Instead, more cleverly, they get Adler to show that he is confused about his own claim. Adler is prepared to entertain the possibility that he has misunderstood the fact of his call. And he is abundantly clear in response to the questioning of his bishop that he will subordinate what Jesus has told him in the moment of his apostolic call to the authority of the state church and to the content of scripture. In making these moves, Adler shows himself, I quote, this is Kierkegaard, Adler shows himself a man who has claimed to have had a, revolution, a revelation from the savior in which a doctrine was entrusted to him but it's now been shown that he does not understand himself, is not in agreement with himself, that he neither has a firm and qualitatively unshaken concept of what a revelation is, 
nor does he stand unshakably firm by his assertion. Close quote. Adler, in his response to church questioning, and then in his own subsequent writings, shows himself to write and think not as an apostle, but rather as a private and confused lyrical genius, so says Kierkegaard. Getting Adler to such a position, as Kierkegaard understands it, is consistent with what the state church is and wants. It cannot permit claims to apostleship in the strict and strong sense. It also cannot oppose them by simple denial. It must then persuade the apostle to deny his authority as an apostle by elevating his own lyrical intellectual authority as interpreter of his revelation above the fact of that revelation. The Lutheran state church does on this view something very much like what the Soviet state used to do in its show trials. That is, it shows not that the apostle isn't one, but rather that even he doesn't think he is. I told you Kierkegaard was clever, right? That's, um... So far, I've established that Kierkegaard takes Adler's writings and acts subsequent to his receipt of a revelation to show that he does not take himself to be an apostle because he does not take his own apostolic authority seriously. Indeed, he contradicts that authority by subjecting it to sources of authority external to itself, his own interpretive skills and the judgments of the church, for example. But saying all this is neutral with respect to the question of whether Kierkegaard thinks that Adler either did or could have received a revelation of the kind he reports. Kierkegaard could simply be indicating a performative contradiction in the fabric of Adler's words and acts. That is, he could just be showing that you can't coherently claim to be an apostle and then subject your call to external authority, from which nothing immediately follows as to whether Adler received an, uh, an apostolic call or not. So a first sketch of Kierkegaard's argument in the book on Adler is that Adler is either a lyrical genius, according to Kierkegaard's particular understanding of that phrase, or an apostle. That if we, his hearers and readers, take his call seriously, we should consider him an apostle. While if we take his behavior subsequent to his call seriously, we should consider him a confused lyrical genius. And that we must take one or the other seriously. There's much in the book on Adler to support that reading of it. That's really how Kierkegaard sets it up. But there's also much in the text to suggest that Kierkegaard's position is that Adler has not had a revelation at all and is therefore in no sense an apostle. Consider, for example, the following passage, I quote. Either Adler has had a revelation and then he must stand firm by it, act according to it by virtue of it with consistency, or he has had no revelation. He himself says that he has had a revelation, but it's easy to show by his later statements that he does not stand firm by it. Indeed, it is easy to show that he does not even hold firmly to the Christian concept of a revelation. Ergo, we conclude that he has had no revelation. Close quote. This is pretty decisive, and it occurs as part of a long discussion of the ways in which Adler has volatilized the idea of a revelation not note a revelation proper, but rather the idea of a revelation. To volatilize an idea in Kierkegaard's lexicon is to vaporize it into the mists of universal history, to turn what had been concrete and particular and un unsubsumable, quote, the point of departure that cannot be mediated, close quote, the extraordinary person's starting point that is the intersection of time with eternity, to turn all that into a mere instance of something greater than itself. Adler does not understand Christianity, Kierkegaard thinks, and has therefore confused, I quote, the falling of the veil from his eyes with his having had a revelation, close quote. That is, roughly, Adler may have seen for a moment what Christianity is. He may have, for the first time, become a Christian, fully available to himself and to the Lord, but he lacked the conceptual equipment to understand what had happened to him, and so all he could do was take what had happened as an apostolic commission and then performatively contradict even that, to even that taking by his later words on work and works. On this reading, Kierkegaard is clear that Adler is no apostle, not even a confused one. 
And this, I think, is what Kierkegaard actually thinks by the time we reach the end of the book on Adler. By then, Kierkegaard has forgotten that he is allowing the possibility that Adler may have received an apostolic call and has arrived at the position that that is most certainly not the case. So much, too briefly, for Kierkegaard's understanding of the Adler case, I omit discussion of wonderful rhetoric about um, the meaning of Adler burning his Hegelian books. Uh, Kierkegaard elegantly arrives at the conclusion that that act by itself shows that Adler was still a Hegelian. Um, you can imagine how that goes, but I won't go through it. It's very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> now, the third movement of this talk. Some thoughts as to how the idea of a contemporary apostolic commission might be better treated than Kierkegaard does. And I'll repeat here my tentativeness about this. Kierkegaard thinks, and here I perhaps exaggerate, but not much, that the content of every revelation, and hence the content of every actual and possible apostolic proclamation, is essentially the same. That content is the essential paradox of the intersection of eternity and time, which is the incarnation. The proclamation of this is what apostles do, and it is what they are commissioned to do. Every instance of it, quote, remains essentially just as new, just as paradoxical, close quote, as every other instance. What St. Paul as apostle proclaimed then is in content no different from what Martin Luther as apostle, if he was one, proclaimed. And their proclamations require from those who hear them, if they are taken seriously as apostolic, that they be treated as commands, that those who proclaim them in this way are to be obeyed. This is because Kierkegaard takes apostolic authority to participate in divine authority and therefore to participate in the, quote, eternal essential qualitative difference, close quote, that belongs to the Lord. A difficulty for Kierkegaard's analysis of the Adler case is that much in the fabric of his own thought suggests exactly that it ought to be possible for there to be contemporary apostles, contemporary, that is, with himself and by extension with us. If being a Christian just means arriving at a kind of contemporaneity with Jesus, a contemporaneity that's always the same, then there's no reason, or at least no obvious reason, to think that apostolicity should be limited to the period of Jesus' contemporaries. Apostolicity, after all, on the kinds of definition we have before us, is an instance exactly of contemporaneity with Jesus. The apostle is faced with Jesus, called and instructed by him. And it seems natural enough to think of apostolic contemporaneity exactly as a kind or species of the contemporaneity that is Christianity's simpliciter. And this is exactly how Kierkegaard does think of it and analyze it throughout most of the book on Adler. Adler is treated as possibly being an apostle, which he could not be were apostolicity to be restricted in principle to Jesus' contemporaries. I've shown that Kierkegaard arrives at the conclusion that Adler is no apostle, but that's a de facto conclusion, not a de jure one. But if there can, in principle, be contemporary apostles, and if Adler isn't one, then Kierkegaard must have at hand criteria by which to decide whether to treat a putative apostle as a real one. The criterion he supplies in the book on Adler is a negative one. It suffices for those faced with someone who claims to have been called as an apostle to reject that claim if the claimant's treatment of his own call does not exhibit the features proper to apostles. We've seen those features to include a quiet certainty that an apostolic call has in fact been received, a proclamation of the revelation without justification of it as such, a renunciation of loquaciousness, and above all, a refusal to subject the content of the revelation to criteria for its identification and interpretation extrinsic to itself. It's because Adler's behavior does not exhibit these features that Kierkegaard in the end rejects his claim to apostleship. Kierkegaard deploys here an epistemological criterion. That is, he asks Zechariah's question, how shall I know this? And he answers the question negatively, of course. What he's asking about is how shall I know whether Adler is an apostle or not? Given this mode of procedure, we can ask, could there be contemporary apostles 
who pass this epistemic test. Apostles who behave after they've been called as Kierkegaard thinks apostles ought to behave, which is to say as if they have in fact been called. If Kierkegaard is to be consistent, the answer to this surely has to be yes. But this answer indicates a fairly serious difficulty internal to Kierkegaard's thought about the nature of Christianity and about what it is to be a Christian. Christian faith for Kierkegaard relies upon revelation. It's a dialectical and paradoxical response to something authoritatively given, something that could not be arrived at or constructed by human beings. The locus classicus for this revelation for Kierkegaard is the text of scripture. This text is not and cannot be shown to be properly apostolic, a proper locus of revelation by a set of criteria brought to it from outside itself. To attempt that would exactly be to subject the particular revelation to the universal, to turn it into an instance of something that embraces and subsumes it. In brief, to treat it as Hegel, or at least as Kierkegaard's imagination of Hegel, would. And yet, Kierkegaard does subject Adler, and thereby other candidates for contemporary apostleship, to the kinds of epistemic test he rejects in principle as appropriate for the testing of scripture, as apostolic witness or as appropriate for use by particular apostles as tests for the genuineness of their call. If we shouldn't go epistemic, and thereby also Hegelian, as Kierkegaard would see it, in the former cases, why should we do so in these latter-day instances? Why aren't we, if we do that, subsuming putative revelations and putative apostolic calls into a universal schema? one that requires evidence extraneous to themselves for the assessment of their validity. Let's return our thoughts for a moment to the overture with which I began, and I'm beginning to approach now the end, the coda. I mean the distinction between Zechariah's and Mary's response to the revelation, the call, with which they were faced. Zechariah is struck dumb exactly because he retreats to epistemology when addressed by the angel. Mary is praised and blessed exactly because she does not do so. He, Zechariah, wants to be convinced. She, Mary, wants to understand. The former is the wrong thing to do, the latter the right thing, at least if what you're faced with is a revelation fact, an apostolic call from the Lord. Kierkegaard treats Adler's claim to have received an apostolic call very much as Zechariah treats his own call. At least, he does this by the time we reach the end of the book on Adler. Kierkegaard asks to be convinced, and he isn't. There are differences, certainly, between Zechariah and Kierkegaard on this matter. Among the more important of these is that Zechariah responds to his own call and that Kierkegaard responds to somebody else's. But I don't think this makes much of a difference for the questions I'm addressing this evening. A consistent Kierkegaardian position would ask the question, will you obey or will you not obey, of someone else's revelation every bit as much as of his own. This is just how he advocates responding, for example, to St. Paul's claim to and communication of his apostolic call. And he has no in-principle restriction of apostolicity to the time of Jesus. So, if he is to remain consistent, the same response ought to be offered to contemporary claimants to apostolicity as to the contemporaries of Jesus. And this exactly means that the epistemological question, convince me, why should I believe you, give me some evidence, is ruled out for the very asking of it already treats the apostle not as someone with a word from the Lord, but rather as what Kierkegaard calls a genius, a man with an argument to be, to be assessed in worldly terms. But if one is not to ask Zechariah's question of claimants to apostolicity, what is one to do? In suggesting an answer to that question, and in bringing this talk to an end, you'll be glad to know, I'll go beyond what Kierkegaard says and I hope resolve the tension I've identified in his thought. 
But before doing that, I'd like to emphasize the deep rightness, the profundity and wit of Kierkegaard's thought about the inappropriateness of asking the epistemic question about apostolicity. Kierkegaard sees clearly and shows with great power what's wrong with taking Zechariah's approach. And although I'm not aware that he ever appeals to the two enunciations in Luke 1 to support the position, I think he would like the line I've taken here on those texts. I am convinced, that's to say, by the essentials of Kierkegaard's line on apostolicity. What I'm not convinced by is the fact that he doesn't apply it consistently to people like Adler. How might that be done? How might we renounce Zechariah's question even about people like Adler? It would have to go like this, I think. A Christian would not ask Adler or his contemporary kin, of whom there are of course many, to convince us that they have been called and addressed by the Lord when they claim to have been. No, we would instead ask them something like Mary's question. How is this? Tell me more. Tell me what you've been told. I should like to think about it, to consider it as a word of the Lord, to ponder it further. Luke's Gospel, shortly after the Annunciation passages I've mentioned, says that Mary pondered all the things she'd been told by the angel. And this is the ground for the ancient Christian thought that Mary is the type and model of the Christian intellectual, the Christian theologian indeed, because of the pondering. Submissive pondering. That, I suggest, is the right response and the right Kierkegaardian response to hearing about something the Lord has said, whether to oneself or to another. The submissive part of submissive pondering treats the apostle as an authority because he has been called by the Lord. And the pondering part of submissive pondering, which Mary exemplifies in a response to the angel, and Kierkegaard exemplifies in part anyway in his response to Adler, tries to understand the apostolic message and to identify what in it can be appropriated and acted upon. Notice, to return again to the scriptural account of the angel's response to Mary, Gabriel doesn't respond to Mary's question, how shall this be, with anything like, just shut up and accept it, woman, it's a revelation, isn't it? (laughs) No, he tells her something more, even if something itself puzzling and in need of further elucidation and pondering. I can imagine you thinking, so does he mean that we should accept all those who claim to have been called by the Lord as apostles? Aren't the streets full of them, full of crazy people who think they've been entrusted with revelation? Surely it can't be right to accept all of them and to treat everything they say as authoritative? Well, yes and no. Yes, If all we're considering is the properly Christian response to people like Adler, then we should refuse the epistemic question for the reasons already canvassed. And we should, where we have time and space enough to do so, respond by pondering, by considering whether there's anything here we can understand, anything here we can appropriate and act upon, anything here that can nourish and nurture our lives as Christians. Often, perhaps even usually, the answer to those questions will be no. We'll find what's said by contemporary apostles murky, puzzling, incomprehensible, or in some other way dubious. I think all of that, for example, about Adler's revelation, as Kierkegaard clearly also did. And in such cases, it will be perfectly proper to leave what's said aside as something we have at the moment no use for and no understanding of. A judgment such as that, however, does not require us to adopt the stance of Zechariah. Neither does it require us even to judge that the person person addressing us is no apostle. It requires only the conclusion that there's nothing I can do with this at the moment, or the conclusion that something about this seems false or wrong or confused to me. But those judgments are not epistemic judgments. And there is yet something more to be said. And it is, I suppose, somewhat in the nature of a Catholic altar call, which it's a little embarrassing to be making in this deeply and properly Baptist place. I admire Baylor's Baptist heritage enormously and its public embrace of it, 
I think, too, that we Catholics have a lot to learn from Baptists, and indeed even from Lutherans, such as Kierkegaard. But there is something in the logic of the position on apostolicity I've just set forth, a Marian rather than a Zechariah-like position, that is deeply relevant to the claims of Catholic Christianity. And I'd like to end by noting that relevance, that resonance. Among the things that Christians gifted and called as apostles have often said and continue to say is that there is a church founded upon the rock of Peter and that, a trust entrusted, and that entrusted to it with a fullness and perfection not found elsewhere is the gift of preserving and explicating the Christian revelation, of showing ever more fully what that revelation means. That church is the one in full communion with the Bishop of Rome, who, as I speak, bears the name of Francis. A Marian response to claims to apostolicity, such as the one I've been advocating here, requires that this, too, be pondered. And I hope you will ponder it. Kierkegaard, I think, would not have pondered it for long. Among other things, it would probably have sounded too Hegelian to him implying, as it does, that there is progression, at least in our understanding, of revelation. But still, there is much in his treatment of the Adler case that suggests, as I've tried to show, the possibility of a consistently Marian response to claims to apostolicity, and that permits, if not requires, the possibility of contemporary apostles. And there's a final teasing piece of evidence from Kierkegaard's almost endless work of revising the text of the book on Adler. It is that among the pseudonyms he considered publishing it under was Petrus Minor, the Little Rock, a pseudonym that I think he had not used before and of course did not finally use in this case because the book wasn't ever published. But maybe it's suggestive. Perhaps it points us in the direction of thinking about the Little Rock's relation to the big one. The big one being, of course, St. Peter and his successors as Bishop of Rome. But that is a conceit rather than a claim, a conceit in the sense of a literary conceit, that is. Maybe the other kind too, but uh, that is a conceit rather than a claim. And with it, and with the exhortation to read more Kierkegaard, which can only do you good, I'll end this talk tonight. Thank you for your attention. Yes, yes. We have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. You know how we do this. We have some microphones here. And so uh, Paul would be delighted to respond. Steve, yes, instruct me, please. <laughs> no, that, was, that was a marvelous talk, and I. I Appreciate it very much, and, and mostly agree, I think. But I, I hear here's the here's the question. It, it does seem, despite your, the the power of your co, of your uh, uh, overture, <laughs> and and the, the exegesis there, it does seem like there's something inescapably epistemic about the way we will respond. And I suspect that might even be true if one is pondering rather than, uh, in this sense that that. Knowing, as we do know, that there are many claims to revelation and they can't all be true, we inevitably ask ourselves, which ones are true and how do we know that? And I think Kierkegaard thought that too. Uh, in fact, he says in the, the other book time and time again that we need criteria. But I think, I think his way of trying to resolve the problem was to say the criteria must not be criteria of this sort criteria that require me to evaluate the content of the revelation, either the command or the content, independently, as you say, extrinsic. But he does give other criteria, which I think maybe deserve the name epistemic criteria, criteria uh, that might bear on the question of whether there is indeed a revelation fact, independent of the content of the revelation. I don't know if you want to respond. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, mean I, I certainly agree that, um, Going epistemic, as I put it, is so hard not to do 
that it seems that we can't not do it. That if we're faced, if I meet someone on the street and he says, Jesus just told me, then comes some stuff, um, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go epistemic, almost certainly, in, in some sense of that phrase. Um, and I agree with you, too, that Kierkegaard does that with Adler, and that's why he decides in the end that Adler doesn't, in fact, have a revelation. But what I wanted to try is what it would look like if we really were consistent in trying not to do that. Um, and I think there is a track for thought here. Um, I do think there's a difference. I'm not sure I've got it quite right yet, but I do think there's a difference. I, I do think that one can interpret Mary's response in such a way that it's without epistemic significance. Let's say it's not trying to adjudicate what this means, nor what kind of a thing it is. It's accepting it as given and simply wanting to know more about it. So there seems to me still a principal distinction between that and the um, arrival at and deployment of criteria about this kind of thing, whatever it is. And I guess with respect to Kierkegaard, I would have liked I would have liked him to renounce criteria even more than he does. And he goes a long way in doing that because most criteria that we might use to discriminate, for example, between um, a revelation fact or its lack, he wouldn't want. Most of them he wouldn't want because they would be extrinsic, they would be drawn from some understanding of the nature of human beings or history or the meaning of life or something like that. Um, so he doesn't want any of that. So the criteria he does want are complicated. They're to do with this, what I call, performative contradiction. You do that and you have a criterion for it. But I think you could, it's possible, maybe, to push the trajectory of thought in him just that bit further to ask what would it look like if we just stopped doing that altogether or tried to. And in the end, it's going to rest upon whether we can make this kind of conceptual cut between uh, the Marian, I would like to understand this, and the Zechariah, so I've got some criteria and you need to meet them for me. Um, can we actually make that cut? I think we might be able to, but it's a question, certainly. Paul, thanks very much. Would it be too outrageous to push what you've been presenting here to say that what we're asking for, or what we're seeing in Mary, is a teleological suspension of uh, the epistemic, uh, and that what we actually see is an absolute duty to obey God uh, that comes, um, certainly without all of the knowledge that's necessary, even knowledge that doesn't cohere. Is this, is this, too, is this too harsh, too hard? No, I, I, I actually don't mind that. Um, I think whether, whether one would be comfortable talking that way about Mary would depend on, at least in part, on what you want to do with um, tropes of vision. What I mean by that is that um, one way to think about um, Mary's response to the angel and one way to think about what she moves toward has to do with not arriving at knowledge exactly, but rather at being faced with something, seeing something face to face. And if that's the point of the question, then the, uh, the question that is to say, how shall this be? If the point of the question, the, the question of that sort is to make a certain kind of vision possible, and if that's what the teleological suspension of the epistemic is okay with meaning, then I'm okay with it. But what the teleological suspension of the epistemic might mean is that eventually we'll get to the point where we know all the criteria and we can deploy them properly. I don't want it to mean that. That's to say, I think that what's going on with the distinction between Mary and Zechariah is um, the distinction between the call for a radical act of submission 
that doesn't carry with it the thought that once you've made it, you'll have what you thought you needed before you make before you made it. And that's so the the reduction or the removal of the epistemic would go even deeper, perhaps. But that may not at all disagree with, with what you said. It just depends on how one construes the phrase. So it's, a, it's a, certainly a creative suggestion because it provides a nice uh, Kierkegaardian um, way of thinking about the Marian question. Yeah. Thank you for a delightfully composed presentation. I want to suggest a, a, Balti a Bartian alternative to the view you have given and ask why we shouldn't go that way. I'm afraid it will come off as Protestant. Uh, well, was one, I, think. I think so. Yes, right. um, I'm thinking of the threefold concept of the Word of God, where the living Word of God is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, secondarily, the written Word of God is the canonical scripture uh, as the authoritative witness to the living Word of God. Uh, and that would be the sole locus on this model of apostolic authority. Um, and then there's the preached word of God, the spoken word of God, in which um, ordained ministers in the church, um, and I suppose others as well, but especially uh, in the church, um, uh, interpret the scripture in such a way that by the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the words of the minister become for those who hear in the event God speaking to them. And the word of God is still um, happening uh, in the moment of preaching and hearing. But there is no claim for apostolic authority for the preacher. Um, if the word of God happens in that event, uh, it happens in that event. It doesn't have any permanent institutional authority um, and so forth. And on that view, I take it the teaching of the magisterium would fall in the category of preaching rather than, the for, rather than falling in the uh, category of uh, apostolic authority. Um, there would still be uh, the possibility that those human voices would be the voices that speak the word of God to those who hear the word of God in those voices. Um, but one wouldn't need to um, uh, claim for them the sort of um, claim that one makes for uh, apostles which uh, would be limited to questions of canonicity of scripture. W why not that view instead of the one you suggest? Um, yeah. Um, well, it's not a possible view for Catholics. That's part, part of the reason why not. Um, <coughs> but but uh, um, so but let me try and say two things about it. One is I actually don't think that's Kierkegaard's view. So if we're just thinking about Kierkegaard, then I don't think that that would do. Um, that is to say, and I'm very much open to correction by those who know much more than I do about this subject, it does seem to me that Kierkegaard does allow the possibility of apostolicity on his definition. That means direct address to a living, somewhere in this room, a living human being by Jesus with a particular commission, Kierkegaard allows that. So um, in, um, in interpreting Kierkegaard, if we restrict ourselves to that, I think the Bartian uh, alternative sketched wouldn't permit that. So but let's now forget Kierkegaard for a minute um, and let's um, think about this more broadly, theologically. Um, so there are two, two separate issues, I think, here, both of them interesting and neither of them about to be resolved tonight. Um, one is about the depth of ingression in the Christian tradition, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, this is not peculiarly Catholic by any means, the depth of ingression in the Christian tradition of accounts of and understandings of um, direct address by the risen Lord Jesus to individual human beings outside the context of preaching and even outside the context of communal worship at all. Those accounts are deep and broad in the Christian tradition. I'm very uneasy myself, in fact I simply won't really entertain it, um, 
any theological position which rules such things out in principle. Now, one version of, the, of what you just gave us, in fact, does. And that's a problem, I think, and a problem that needs to be thought through. I'm not saying that there's an obviously right answer to it, but just empirically, I think that it, it's difficult. That, so that's one set of issues. Um, the second set of issues has to do with um, what the authority of the preacher or of the Bishop of Rome or of the um, ordinary and universal magisterium of the Catholic Church might come to. I think this is more adjudicable. That is to say, we could probably come to agreement, sort of agreement about that. Um, that is to say, you know, the authority of the magisterium for Catholics does not inhere in the human beings who exercise it, qua human beings, of course. It inheres in them exactly as called and led by God to exercise a particular office. Similarly, mutatis mutandis, I take it, for your friendly neighborhood preacher. When he or she speaks the words of the Lord, which I think we would agree they do, it's not qua Jim or Jane that they do, it's qua preacher that they do. And so that, that's all adjudicable. The, what's not going to be adjudicable, I think, is the enduring authority of formulated teaching because a Bartian line doesn't allow that, as far as I can tell. That is to say, if you've got a body of doctrine that evolves over time, which Catholics certainly think there is, um, that orders the life of an institution in a non-negotiable way. Not that it can't be reinterpreted, of course it's being reinterpreted all the time, but that it's there, that's not negotiable. I don't think the Bartian view permits that. So that's the difficulty there. And both of those are just big difficulties. And I don't mean to say that the Bartian view can't be had, of course. I mean, it can. You just enunciated it. But I do think it has these difficulties. The first one, a real one for all Christians, and the second one, just a distinctive difference between a Catholic and Protestant understanding of how the church is ordered over time. I'll say one more thing about this, though, because this is a weird Kierkegaardian thing that's bothered me for years. I still don't get it. So, um, how can one not well, we say... can't hear it. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Um, how can one not allow, how can one not see that in the order of knowing, the revelation is progressive? I mean, it's got to be, right? You, um, the revelation is given perfectly once for all in Jesus Christ. Yes, all Christians agree about that, right? This is fundamental Christian doctrine. But Kierkegaard seems sometimes to think that we won't come to any new, un we Christians won't come to any new understandings of this revelation. That seems to me out to lunch. Um, how can that be right? Um, the, so, I mean, that's a, just a puzzlement. Does he really think that? How could any sane person think that? Um, so that's a, a big issue for me in understanding Kierkegaard. Well, I'll shut up now. Sorry. Yes. Oh, he was here oh, first. Sorry. Pass. I want to say, I want to say, um, Tom, um, Tom was a student at Duke, and he has been of great help to me as instructor in coming to better understandings of Kierkegaard. So, um, instruct me some more. If anything was wrong, it was my fault. Like, I liked your development of pondering, uh, but one question that did come to mind is, what happens in the situation? Um, where the revelation fact is a command or a demand that requires immediate obedience. Yeah. So if you could develop that. Yeah, um, right. So right. So some revelation facts or putative revelation facts or whatever we're about to call them um, do require something. Actually, that's true of the, the angels addressed to Mary, I think. Um, that's to say she had to say yes or no. Uh, that's a decision that had to be made. And, you know, good Christian doctrine requires that she could have said no. Um, so um, much uh, in putative revelation facts will be like that. There'll be a command, do this, do that. And one either will or one won't. So there won't be time for pondering. That's right. So the pondering doesn't... The pondering... So this, is why, this is why the really difficult... I think consistently Kierkegaardian and certainly, not certainly, but probably right position is that one should accept prima facie all putative revelation facts as such. 
Um, now, then, so when they command you to do something, like supposing somebody walks up to you and says, Jesus says, shoot yourself in the head or whatever, you know, um, and you decide not to do that. You decide that on the whole you're not going to shoot yourself in the head. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that you've applied a set of epistemic criteria to discriminate this putative revelation fact from other ones and decided that the criteria mean that this one isn't one? That's one thing it could mean. But another thing it could mean is that, no, um, I accept this as a putative revelation fact, but I find myself unable to act on it at the moment. And these are different things to mean. And then one might ponder it more, and maybe six weeks later you might shoot yourself in the head. Um, and the, the example is ill-chosen, but, but you, you see what I mean? So the, the refusal to act on something doesn't immediately rule out accepting it as a putative revelation fact, I think. Um, now, there are difficulties here, but that's what I would like. What I'm trying is to actually make this work. I'm not sure it can, but that's... No, I, I think that's a coherent but radical answer. Yeah, yeah, okay. so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That's, that's yeah. My question is actually very related because um, in, in, in the epistles, um, Paul talks about uh, test the spirits and, yeah. and test everything and hold on to what is good. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious, does the paradigm of pondering that you've explained, does that exclude kind of testing the content of Revelation against the scripture? Um, um, no, I don't think, okay, so it depends on what the question was, right? Um, is it okay if we bracket the question of what Paul means by testing the spirits? Yes. Because that's a very difficult question, I think. Um, so it depends what the question is. Supposing the question is this. Um, well, I, yeah, cool. And what I, I guess, specifically he talks about prophecy, I do believe, and test prophecy and hold on to what is good in, within prophecy that you receive. Yeah. So um, if the question is figure out whether it is prophecy or not, that's one question. If the question is assume that it is prophecy but decide whether to act upon it or to do what seems to follow from accepting it as prophecy, that's another question. These are not the same question. So okay. far so, so good? So a lot would hinge upon which question we're asking. The, 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 line I'm, the line I'm increasingly thinking is not finding broad acceptance here. The line I'm trying to suggest is that um, the first kind of question, figure out whether it is prophecy or not, is a bad question. Okay. The second kind of question, decide what to do next, is a good question. Oh. But they're not the same question. And that's, so I mean, again, these are just types, but the Zechariah Mary question, it, it, distinction is exactly that, right? Zechariah wants to know why I should even think this is something that's going to happen at all, right? And he gets slapped around for that. Mary doesn't want to know that. She wants to know, okay, what now? And these are different questions, and therefore the testing the spirits language, I hope, would be in the second sphere, not the first. Is that? Oh, I mean, that makes sense to me. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you for your fine lecture, Dr. Riffis. Uh, I'm particularly happy with the uh, Zechariah Mary comparison. It's captured my imagination. I think it may stick with me as well. Um, I share some of your intuitions of a suspicion of epistemology, of at least leading with it. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure I go all the way with you. I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, uh, it seems to me there's a difference between rejecting epistemology as first philosophy and rejecting it as, any, as legitimate altogether. Uh, I can imagine a position of fetus querens intellectum where the intellectum actually allows for some epistemological questions, which may be of import. Uh, and so, uh, to me, that, that may be, I, I don't know if I want to, uh, you know, castigate Zechariah for epistemology pure, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe a kind of ordering, or as you say, first prove it to me, then I'll obey. Um, and uh, uh, you said, uh, you say a couple times of, of Kierkegaard, you say that Kierkegaard asked Adler, oh, why should I believe you? Um, uh, at the moment, I'm not entirely convinced that that is what Kierkegaard asks. Um, perhaps you would uh, consider this stipulation. Is there a difference between having a negative criterion versus having positive? Uh, I would agree. I, I don't see Kierkegaard saying, well, okay, if you're going to be an apostle, you have to check off these seven things, and you've got to be uh, uh, fairly handsome, and you have to you know, have, be an employee as a plumber for a few years. And, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have a list of very specific qualities. 
But surely uh, you don't have to have that in order to be able to have some criteria to rule somebody out and say, well, this may well as disqualify you. And Adler's existential self-contradiction may be such a disqualifier. What I have in the back of my mind, I believe it's uh, from Deuteronomy, uh, where it says, this is, how, you know, uh, this is how you know you have a false prophet. If you prophesy something, it doesn't come true. Now, that's not the same thing as, here's what a true prophet will look like. But don't fear the man who prophesies falsely, perhaps as Adler has done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, right. So, I mean, I'm not, I, I have nothing against epistemology in general, you know. Um, <laughs> in life, we have to ask these questions. But... Um, in, with respect to questions of religious significance or questions about when the Lord speaks and to whom, that's where I was trying to have a problem with it. So, um, so that, that's an important qualification. Um, there is an important difference between negative criteria and positive ones, um, I think, and certainly Kierkegaard's criterion for, in the end, rejecting Adler's apostolicity is a negative one. Um, but I do think... Well, this is where I would benefit from help with reading the text. I mean, I've tried hard to read it, but it does seem to me that in the book on Adler, you have two lines of thought that don't really, in the end, hang together. One line of thought is, okay, I'll allow that he might have been an apostle, and then I'll show that he performatively contradicted his apostlehood and didn't understand what it means to be an apostle. Kierkegaard has a lot to say about, which I didn't go into, about how... Adler's real problem is that he hasn't been catechized properly. You know, he doesn't have Christian concepts. He doesn't understand Christianity. He's a Lutheran pastor, of course, but that's, you know, that's, if anything, supportive evidence for Kierkegaard of not understanding Christianity. Um, so, so, so that's one line of argument. That's per, I, mean, you know, I think that's great. You know, that, that just points to being an apostle and behaving like this don't fit together. But, of course, it doesn't follow from that that you're not an apostle. It just follows from that, that being an apostle and the, doing this don't hang together. So that's one line of thought. That's, that's where he starts. The first, you know, half, two-thirds, something of the book are really like that. But then, then you get something else. But he's not an apostle, really. And that's something else. And it's that... So to go back to, to the question, the false prophecy one, um, I prefer a line more like the first half to two-thirds of the book on Adler about prophets than like the last part of the book. Um, but it may be that I'm not reading the book quite right, so I'd, I'd be happy for further um, illumination about that too. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question kind of has to do with what you actually just said, um, but it was going more into um, Zacharias's response to the angel. He, you know, the epistemological question, he kind of showed this doubt and this wanting to know without a willingness to believe or obey um, that got him muted, but it's still, but the revelation still, according to Christians, came true, and he still, in the end, was able to proclaim something by when he, you know, finally says his name is John. Um, and so I guess my question is, how does that have to, what does that bring to bear on our human, sometimes wrong responses to God, but then God's, um, how he still, when something is true and of him, it works out regardless of our initial reaction. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a really profound question, I think. Um, so I'm going to ask you to answer it, not me. Um, <laughs> so let me ask it this way to you. Yes. Do you allow that Mary could have said no? Yes. What would have happened if she had? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I guess he would have picked somebody else. But, right. oh so, yeah, so but, mm -hmm. oh no. No, no, please, please, I want to hear that. <laughs> well, it's, I just, then I think it's interesting, because Zachariah didn't really get to say anything. <laughs> but I guess he said yes, because, well, he said yes in the end by doing what's necessary to have a kid. Um, he said yes. <laughs> Mary said yes in the act of accepting the Angels. It's different, right, so it's different. Yes. So, different. okay, so the, let me try a line on this, see if you'll agree with it. Um, I think it's, it's intrinsic and proper to Christian faith to believe that 
God's providential purposes will finally be realized. Mm. That's got to be right. Mm -hmm. That's the eschatological hope. But it doesn't follow from that, I'm sure you'd agree, that it doesn't matter what we do because it's all going to be all right anyway. So Zechariah answering wrongly mattered. It's not that it mattered in that John didn't get born or didn't get called John or something. It didn't matter in that way, but it mattered. Um, and it mattered in, that, in the way that such things always do, which is that the fabric of God's providential desire for good is at least temporarily rent. There's a hole in it. And the ho that's represented here beautifully by the symbol of being mute. You know, he can't say anything. Um, and so, yes, God's providence always, finally, eventually finds a way. That's what the incarnation is all about, right? Um, but... Um, our going epistemic at the wrong moments can nonetheless, in small ways, recapitulate the very structure of the fall that screwed all this up to begin with. So it's both and, right? I mean, it, 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 it does affect the nature of things, what we do, even though it can't finally frustrate the outcome. Does that sound right to you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. One last question. Um, one last brief question. Right. right. Um, so I'm going to probably reveal also my sort of popish sympathies in a Protestant crowd um, by uh, wanting to know more about the sort of necessity of the formal act of submission to a revelation fact rather than going epistemic. Um, but I want to ask um, in response to what you said about the difficulty of, of not going epistemic, the kind of ingrainedness of asking the epistemic question, um, whether there's uh, a place in Kierkegaard's meditation on this for a way of making uh, the epistemic question a practice. I'm thinking of, um, is it book seven in Augustine's Confessions where he uses the sort of, uh, all of these sort of spatio-temporal conundrums to sort of finally come to the idea that this is not something that can be the, the fact of God's relationship to creation can't be verified in, in spatiotemporal criteria. Is there a way um, in which that's showing that asking the epistemic question at all is already subtended by the unavoidability of, um, of that purely formal um, sort of agreement to the, the validity of a revelation fact? Is it simply the particularly dismal state of historicist sort of biblical exegesis in Kierkegaard's time that doesn't allow for that sort of pushing uh, epistemic or rational historicist um, inquiry to its breaking point where it has to admit that it is not a criterion on which yeah. these sorts of things can be determined at all. Right, now again, that's a really good question. Um, really briefly, that requires a lot of discussion, I think. Um, I th I'm very, very sympathetic to the view that um, epistemic criteria can't ground any enterprise and they show themselves not to be able to do that. Um, that seems right. And it's, it's characteristic of, um, well, he Hegelianism broadly understood as Kierkegaard tends to understand it anyway, and therefore also of the subjection of scripture and Christian history to that mode of thought to try to do that that's also right. This is the story of modernity in brief, if you like. So that's all correct, I think. Um, yeah, I think we'd have to leave that one there. There's just too much to say. One final observation. This thing about Zechariah and Mary, you know, of course I didn't make this up. Um, so let me just give you brief antecedents for it. It's, it was for me about 25 years ago, a transformative moment when I heard somebody give a homily on this. Um, on this, two enunciations. I'd never thought, there are two? There are two? Yeah, there actually are two. Okay, right. Um, so you can find this in Augustine. Four or five of his sermons treat this, and they do it pretty much like this. And Newman has a fabulous sermon on exactly this. And he has it, of course, as he always does, just about completely right. So there's a tradition within Christianity of dealing with this. I would love to know if Kierkegaard ever treats this, um, because it's something he would like, it seems to me. So there is a, there is a you know, I didn't, yes. Okay. Please join me.